Unless you live in a cave or are Italian. By now, you know that between mid-November and mid-December 2022, the World Cup was being held in Qatar. Or as many call it, the World Cup of Shame. Why? Well, because it has been held in an authoritarian country without democracy and where human rights are conspicuous by their absence. In Qatar, the law is based on Sharia, the Islamic law. For example, homosexuality is forbidden and persecuted. But perhaps we can find something terribly questionable, reprehensible, and directly related to this World Cup. And that has been the lack of labor rights of immigrant workers. In many cases, we could even call it slavery. That is why all the media outlets have condemned what is happening in Qatar. Now, one thing we must ask ourselves is, where does legitimate concern for human rights end and posturing begin? Because let's be clear, Qatar has always been like this. Even when Barcelona players wore this jersey. When Barcelona Football Club won the Champions League seven years ago, tens of millions of petrodollars came out of Qatar to pay the salaries of Messi, Neymar, Xavi, and company. At that time, Qatar already had the slavery regime, or as they call it, the Kafala. And that's not all. Did you know that Qatar is not the only country where we can find this system? Take a look at this map. There are seven other countries that still use it to a greater or lesser extent. Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, and Oman. In general, all these countries have the same problems regarding the lack of labor rights that we can find in Qatar. But pay attention, because it's not only the Arab petro monarchies that can be condemned for the kafala system, since this issue involves such surprising participants as the Ugandan government. And what does Uganda have to do with it? Over the course of the video, we're going to explain the whole situation. The truth is that there are many half-truths about Kafala. For example, I'm sure many of you have in mind this exclusive article published a year ago by the British newspaper, The Guardian. Revealed, 6,500 migrant workers have died in Qatar since World Cup awarded. It is clear that the headline clearly seeks to link the dead workers to the World Cup concession. The problem is that not all immigrants in Qatar are involved in construction to begin with. There are many domestic staff, drivers, hotel workers, and in short, all kinds of service personnel. Because let me tell you that you will never see a Qatari sweating in their tunic. <laughs> On the other hand, those 6,500 are deaths in general, not deaths that we should attribute directly to occupational accidents. So that's a very sensationalist headline, but don't take my word for it. Instead, take a look at what Dr. Andreas Krieg of King's College London says. The Guardian's original report was with 6,500 deaths over 10 years among 1.4 million migrant workers a year from five countries. Out of 1 million young men under the age of 25, 560 die each year in Germany, i.e. 5,600 in 10 years. Dr. Andreas Krieg. Clearly seen in this light, the figure is not that remarkable. But this is not to downplay labor abuses or to say that Qatar is a worker's paradise. Not at all. What we want to underline is that in order to see the scope of the Kafala problem, it is necessary to know what the real situation of labor rights is in these countries and also to analyze whether or not they have done anything to eradicate this abusive system. What is clear is that with hearth truths, nothing is achieved. In today's video, we will draw attention to details that often escape the debate and that are of interest for forming an opinion that goes beyond a catchphrase. So the question is, what is a kafala and how does it work? How do these Persian Gulf countries get their labor? Has the World Cup really served to drive reforms in Qatar as FIFA advocates, or are they exaggerating? <laughs> the Last Bastion of Slavery. The kafala dates back to the Bedouin traditions of the Gulf Arab countries. According to their customs, the host of foreign visitors assumed legal and economic responsibility for these visitors as their kafil. Kafil in Arabic means sponsor or guarantor. The idea was that these hosts or sponsors were responsible for everything for their guests, both for the good and the bad. That is, if a foreigner visited you, you saw to it that he or she lacked nothing. Now, if that guest of yours turned out to be a thief, the responsibility also fell on you. In theory, it doesn't sound so crazy, does it? However, this ideal of the kafala system changed completely when Qatar became a British protectorate in 1916. <laughs> The current kafala system, understood as a mixture of immigration laws and policies, was a creation of the British Empire, which enjoyed great influence in the Persian Gulf during the first half of the 20th century. This system allowed the British to bring in a lot of colonial subjects from different corners of the empire, especially from South Asia. As you can imagine, all this was especially useful after the oil boom. 
1971, Qatar got rid of the British protectorate and became an independent country. And that's when they said, hey, it's a good idea to have people from India coming to work. So like the seven countries mentioned before, Qatar maintained the kafala system and molded it into the kind of modern slavery we know today. As a result, many of the immigrants who arrived in these countries need a kafil to take responsibility for their legal status. And depending on the case, they may come to depend on him for everything. Many of the immigrants who come to work in countries under the kafala system often complain that their wages fall far short of what is promised. They are even forced to work for months at a time, even though they are not being paid at all. There are also complaints that employers look for any pretext to confiscate part of the salary, marathon working hours, and almost no rest. But not only that, the kafil can also confiscate your passport. In other words, in some cases, they not only exploit you, but they can force you to stay in the country. In other words, you are forced to work whether you want to or not. That sounds like slavery. Yeah slavery. Although this problem seems to mainly affect unskilled immigrants from India or Bangladesh, it can also affect well-known footballers. Zahir Balunis returns to France after 17-month kafala dispute with Qatari club Al Jaish. In this case, we're talking about a French footballer who was held for 17 months in Qatar. International pressure made it possible for Balunis to leave. Unfortunately, others do not have so much support. Now, the most perverse thing of all is that in the old days, if you wanted slaves, you invaded a territory, captured your enemies, and then put them to work in your service until their last breath. Today, in the middle of 2022, it is the slaves who come to you. In some countries, this has become a social alarm. Take a look at what Rodrigo Duterte said a year ago when he was still president of the Philippines. We called on the world to dismantle the Hinos Kafala system. Itoring isa because the Filipino is no slave unto anyone, anywhere. The kafala has no place there because it's a set up for slavery. Either you correct it or we will ask our workers, Filipino workers, to go home. Okay, it is true that bringing out Duterte to defend human rights seems like a curious farce. But man, for a ruler to speak out against Kafala, we had to bring him out because what he says here is spot on. This is the reality of these countries. With their oil and gas exploitations, these countries have hyper-fortified themselves and demand more and more labor. So there is kind of tacit social pact. The local population is a small but very powerful minority. They are the citizens who benefit from the privileges financed by the state's energy wealth. In Qatar, they number around 380,000, represented about 10% of a population of nearly 3 million. While the rest, the non-citizens, are the migrant workers. They are the vast majority in the country and the trend continues unabated. Look at 2022. Qatar's population surges by 13.2% with huge influx of foreign workers. If you are a Qatari citizen, you don't even need to work. You have your businesses, your investments, the state gives you a lot of facilities, land, cheap credit, but the hard work is done by immigrants. And the vast majority come mainly from Asian and African countries under the kafala system. Of course, the burning question is, but how do they manage to attract workers who know they are going to be enslaved to a certain degree? We're gonna take a look at that right now. The Arabian Dream. Let's travel for a moment to Kerala, a state in India with a huge population. No less than 35 million people and a very young population to boot. Well, there, they have a problem that nobody could imagine, a lack of labor in the hospitality industry. Why is that? Because more than 2 million Keralites, 17% of the working population, are already working abroad, mainly in Qatar and other Arab nations. What they can earn there, close to $1,000 a month, is six times what they can earn in similar jobs in Kerala. And that makes them willing to pay a bundle to recruitment agencies to get them a job and a kafil in these countries. How much money are we talking about? Well, look closely at the following graph. The dashed horizontal line marks one month's earnings, and the bars represent the number of monthly payments that migrant workers have to pay back for the ability to be able to work in the kafala country in question. As you can see, it costs Bangladeshis and Pakistanis an arm and a leg because they are charged a fortune for the visa. 
Yet, despite these costs and risks, hundreds of thousands of people continue to migrate legally to the Middle East each year. There, in many cases, they endure abusive conditions, but what they earn is a small fortune in their home countries. This money is used on their return to start up businesses to earn a living. It's a hard road, but an alternative for escaping the misery of their countries of origin. Some even manage to set up businesses within the Arab countries themselves. And I know what many of you are thinking. Are there recruitment agencies doing business with the Kafala? How barbaric? Well, wait a minute. There is another player who is becoming responsible for many human rights violations. Because in Africa, there are countries where it is their own government that is sending its citizens there. This is the case of Uganda. The Minister of Labour herself, Betty Amongi, explains to you why the government of Uganda has a problem for what they call labour outsourcing. She talks about annual data. Coffee export brought to this country 559 million dollars. Remittances from externalization of labour brought us about 900 million US dollars. African labor is gaining prominence in Kafala countries because the workers are willing to do the same work as Asian staff, but for less money. To give you an idea, in 2021 alone, 85,000 Ugandans participated in the labor outsourcing program to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. The Ugandan government is well aware that in the Persian Gulf countries, there are abusive situations for their expatriate workers, but they also understand that they will earn much more money for their work than if they stay in their own country. It is therefore a question of priorities. And more than one of you will be thinking, but let's see, Josh, how can we prevent this kafala system from perpetuating itself over time? Well, some steps are already being taken. Check it out. Highs and lows of Qatar. Qatar has announced many times that it plans to improve the conditions endured by its workers. However, years went by without significant changes. Despite increasing international pressure, the current emir took office in 2013. In his first years, he devoted himself to bringing order to the country's administration, because it was often unclear who really wielded power in Qatar, whether it was the government or a multitude of parallel agencies. In the end, he replaced the prime minister in 2020 and the changes started to come. Take a look. Qatar enacts minimum wage, worker reforms as World Cup nears. Reforms are intended to dismantle kafala sponsorship system. The new labor laws have changed radically in Qatar, so much so that legally there is no longer a kafala. The consent of the employer, the former kafil, is no longer required to change jobs or leave the country. According to official data, around 350,000 people have already changed jobs since 2020. As you can imagine, the fact that workers can resign is a small incentive for the employer to at least treat them with dignity. Regardless Regarding the minimum wage, it has been set to 1,000 Qatari rials, which is equivalent to around 260 euros. The minimum wage is accompanied by a minimum allowance of 80 euros for food and 130 euros for housing, unless the employer provides both. Let's not kid ourselves. This minimum wage is quite low. However, Qatar is the first country in the Gulf to approve a minimum wage for all workers. Anyway, Qatar and all the countries that worked with the kafala system are encountering the same problem. A legal change can be made. But now the most important thing is still missing, making the cultural change. Some employers are still reluctant to accept the free movement of workers. Many still encounter obstacles when leaving one job and changing to another. Retaliation by their employers is frequent. One of the most common is to maneuver for them to lose their residence permits and report them as having absconded, which can lead to deportation back to their countries of origin. A very clever change in Qatar is that salaries must now be paid by bank transfer to workers. This small detail offers them guarantees that workers will be able to prove whether or not their boss owes them money. In addition, to cover non-payments, the Qatari government launched a workers' support fund in 2019. It has since dispersed $320 million. <laughs> The temporary period during which outdoor work is prohibited from June to mid-September has also been increased to include the hottest 5.5 hours in the middle of the day. And not only that, from now on, construction workers must stop working any time the temperature exceeds 32 degrees Celsius. All these developments in Qatar have been developed in collaboration with the International Labour Organization, an agency belonging to the UN that opened a mission in Qatar in 2018. Its latest report on the country gives a mixed picture. 
Qatar workers' welfare. Reforms made, but challenges remain. In summary, the ILO recognizes that the conditions of thousands of workers have improved, but Qatar must make every effort to ensure that labor laws are enforced. Human rights NGOs such as Amnesty International agree. Because we are talking about the same old problem. The law is one thing, and another is to go after those who break the law. No matter how much Qatar says, we have abolished slavery, look at our laws. Nothing will have been achieved if there is nothing to force employers to comply with the law. These are areas where there is still room for improvement. But now, the question is over to you. Do you think that the legal changes introduced by Qatar are enough? Or are workers still completely helpless? Should we continue to put pressure on all countries that have kafala, or is it none of our business? You can leave me your answers in the comments. And as always, don't forget that we have new videos every week. So subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. See you soon.